Namaste and in La Ketch. And welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefield. And referencing those two phrases once again from the Brahma and the Mayan, one means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you, and the other means I am another you. So those are two ancient philosophies that kind of dovetail into what we might be able to be today. Just think about that. Great, thank you. Now this episode, I've got a, a very special guest that I've, uh, I've known of for decades. He's a five-time international bestseller um, in the top 20 as a strategic um, coach and, and strategist and, and success coach. Um, he's just an all-around great guy who's been through his own trials and tribulations, just as we all have, and made it through and able to look back and help others to, do, to find their own way. So, Mr. Jim Britt, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my pleasure, Jim. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, you're welcome. Uh, you know, you've been uh, kind of a cognitive scientist if you will, for a lot of years in studying the mind's habits and behaviors and patterns and, and all those kinds of things. Um, when you first began to recognize this, was there, you know, kind of a, uh, either an inner voice or, or a conversation you were having with self or, or something that facilitated the beginning of that? Yes, absolutely. Um, Actually, in my, uh, I write about it in my book, Rings of Truth, and um, it's, I, I went through a time about 37 years ago that uh, I thought, you know, I was presenting seminars and had standing ovations, a thousand people, you know, a few times a month, and, mm -hmm. and thought I was doing a great job if I got a standing ovation. Well, and by all and, standards, you were. <laughs> But, but, you know, what I was, I think what I was after was that standing ovation. And, and I, I really wasn't trying to get inside the people to get them to look at themselves and make changes. So I was living in uh, Sedona, Arizona. And place. on top of a hill with a panoramic view, beautiful place. I wake up one morning about 6 a.m. The sun's just coming up. And if you've ever been there and looked, watched the mountains, that they change as the yeah. sun changes. Yeah, we uh, actually got married on the base of Bell Rock. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's cool. That's very cool. Thank you. So I, I'm, I'm here, a, a big home, nice place, you know, all of the trappings of success, you know, the cars and all of that, and uh, money in the bank. And I was lying in bed watching the sun or watching the mountains and the sun. And I started looking around and I'm and thinking about my life. You know, I'm a high school dropout, dropped out in the 10th grade, mm -hmm. you know, no business background, no, no experience of any kind other than picking cotton, uh, pumping gas and working in a factory on an assembly line. Right. And here I am, uh, you know, educating other people on how to do better in life. So I was kind of patting myself on the back. And then I, I suddenly I got this voice in my head and it was me saying to my wife, who is now my ex-wife, uh, once we get all of these things, we're going to be really happy. And mm. then we, now we have all of the things I'm divorced. She lives in another part of the country with two of our children. <laughs> yeah. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And, and I just, I went, wow. And I started kind of looking around my house and I'm going, you know, here I am alone. And I, the, my closet doors were open and, and I started counting my suits. I had 47 tailor-made suits mm. and only seven that I actually wore. And back then you probably could have bought a home in certain parts of the country for what I invested in those suits. And, and I'm going, what, what am I doing? You know, what, what is that about? And well, you were suiting up and showing up. That's what that was about, right? Yeah, you, you know, and I, and I suddenly realized I wasn't happy. Yeah. And I also realized that, that I couldn't continue to, to teach what I was teaching because I was teaching people to be successful and happy, all wrapped in one. Yeah. And I was successful but not happy. And then I walked into my library, and I was a speed reader. Uh, my record is 10 books in one day. And I had like 99% comprehension level. Evelyn Wood would be proud. <laughs> yeah. Well, it wasn't Evelyn Wood. It was somebody that read faster than she did. Okay. <laughs> that taught. But 
I'd read like 4,000 books and I started looking around my library and I, I'd see certain books and I remember what was in them, you know, and I thought, you know, all of them are saying, this is the key to happiness. This is the key to success. This is the key to living a, you know, normal, health, healthy life, whatever. Right. Um, and suddenly realized, I thought, would the average person read this many books? And my conclusion was, no, the average person probably couldn't unless they were a speed reader. Right. Uh, unless they just spent their whole life reading. And I thought, okay, well then, if I didn't find the answers in all of this, these books, it's got to be someplace else. And so I, I went that. to town. I, <laughs> I gave away all of my books except for seven. Uh, I, um, uh, I gave away my clothes except for seven suits. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and a lot of other things I had. I just took them to the Goodwill, Salvation Army. I got rid of everything. And, and I called my assistant. And this is the, the, here's where the life-changing thing happened. I called her and I said, uh, I'm quitting the business. I said, get me out of every speaking engagement you can. If we haven't been paid, we'll give it to somebody else and let them do it. I said, book me a ticket to Hawaii. I said, I want to stay on the island of Kauai on the North Shore. So she did. And Gorgeous place. So I go over there, all I take with me, I didn't take a book, I didn't take a journal, a pencil, paper, nothing, and um, just some hiking boots and towels and bathing suits and shorts, and that was about it. And so the first morning that I was there, I started the hike down the Nepali coast, which is an 11 mile hike. So I went about halfway and I was taking it easy going in and just enjoying the, the scenery and all. And I decided to, to stay in this little shack type thing about halfway in. And so I stayed there, met somebody else that was staying there. We talked for hours. And then I walked on in to the, to the, uh, the beach 11 miles in. And all I had with me was three bottles of water and about three power bars. And that was it, no food. Um, and I ended up staying there for three, almost four days before I started back out again. Hmm. And, and I ran out of water, but there was a waterfall. So I'm drinking water out of the waterfall. And, um, but what happened to me there, and I think it's because I surrendered everything I thought was me. I just dropped it. And it was like, and, I got downloaded with new information. And that's and what I, happens. I, it, and there was a different a different approach. I didn't know what it was exactly. I knew it had something to do with letting go of what's not serving you, but I didn't understand quite what that was. So that's where it all started for me. It's kind of a, a complete submission in the state of vulnerability to something unknown. Yeah. And yet powerful enough that it got you to that place in, in recognizing your own progress in it too right that's the cool thing that and guys like you i've listened to you speak before you're very self-aware you know your processes you kind of like me i analyze myself to death right <laughs> and that's a i think one of the key aspects that um in the development of self-awareness and, and two of the things that i, I think are most important and my wife and i saw these on a sign in the middle of junk of the yucatan jungle on the way to Chichen Itza. And it was observe your intentions and observe your distractions. And I think, you know, from hearing you, that's kind of what you speak towards a lot. Well, what I, what happened over the next, uh, I'd say the next 12 months, but what happened immediately when I came back, mm -hmm. I had a few engagements I couldn't get out of. So I went out to, to speak and I, and I had this newfound insight of some kind and and didn't know how to communicate it. And it was kind of a spiritual awakening. Sure. And, and about half the audience would loved it. And the other half was like, who is this guy? You know, what's he talking about? You know, so I knew I had to bring it down into some uh, layman's terms of some kind that people could understand and apply through their own life. And that's the perfect way. I mean, now, especially, you know, I was unfortunate. That I had a a fortunate, unfortunate, you know, it's kind of one of those mixed bags. Uh, I had a near-death experience in college that I came back understanding that we're cosmic consciousness condensed into form, whether we recognize it or not. And in the process of becoming aware and how reality works, you know, we deepen our understanding of that. Well, 
as an 18 year old, my, after it happened, my parents sent me to shrink. And, and after the third visit, he says, you know, you're, I've listened to you, which he really did. It was one of the best conversation, conversational periods of, of my life. But he says to me, he says, you know, I know you, you're not crazy. What's happened is you've gone through a spiritual awakening. But my advice would be, don't talk to anybody about it because they're not going to understand you. And, you know, he was right that in the initial stages of it, it is ineffable. And to try to articulate it in some kind of reasonable sense-making way, there's so many things that come in simultaneously that it's really hard to do. So how did you manage that? And, and what, well, what was the essence of what you were able to deliver at that point? Um, a few months, uh, six months into it, uh, trying to figure out how to present it and, and make it work for anybody, you know, mm -hmm. that, that they could apply it. A friend of mine that we, we had done, we buy books and we would study them if, if they were really in-depth type books. We would study them and he would call or I'd call him and say, what do you, what do you think about this on page 82, you know, or something? And he'd go sure. look it up. We'd discuss it. So he called me one day and we're discussing something. And before we hang up, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, what does the word resourceful mean to you? And I said, I don't know. I guess using your imagination, being more productive. I said, I don't know. I never really thought about it. He said, oh, it's just an interesting word. I said, oh, okay. So I couldn't quit thinking about it after we hung up. I get home and of course we have no internet or anything. So I look it up in the dictionary and resourceful is defined as once again, full of source. And I thought, Wow, that's pretty interesting. So I look up the keyword source. Right. And it says where all things originate. Not some things, but all things. I'm going, wow. Isn't that interesting? That is powerful, I thought. Absolutely. Well, depending on what you think source is. But right. all things originate. It wasn't a question about some things don't, all things. So I kept looking for the another definition of source. And I looked everywhere. I'd go into the bookstore and I said, do you have like a book on the origin of words and things like that? I couldn't find anything else. And then I was over in England doing a tour. I was in a, a small village, Chester, England. And I see a, a sign that says antique bookstore. It was the hmm. back door of it. So I'm always intrigued by old books. And I thought that might be interesting to go in. So I go in there. The first book I see was a dictionary about this thick. And it said... It had a sign on it that said, do not open, do not touch. Because it was really, I mean, was, I don't know how old it was. I don't know when dictionaries came out, but it was really old. And um, so I thought that probably means people that live in the UK, not me. Of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I carefully, very carefully opened the book to the S's. And I looked up source. And it had some of the same things I'd seen before. And then I one popped out at me. It said source love once again full of love mm -hmm. i thought wow that is powerful because when you want to accomplish something when you make a decision to have that whatever it is right you fall in love with it you fall in source with it where things get created absolutely and and, and if, if you if you're out of that then it's then it's not creating it's creating something totally different still creating from source but still something totally different than what you, if you don't make a firm decision. Right. So that, that is powerful. Then I started thinking about, well, what stops us from being connected there all the time? I thought, well, fear is a big thing. Right. And I thought, wait a minute, there's something wrong with that definition. I said, because there's love and there's fear. And it says all things are created in source. I thought about that for a little bit and I thought, Oh, fear is created in love, presenting it to you, saying, if you take care of this fear, you can have more of me. So it's, it's a thing that we create ourselves. That's a great perspective. And, <laughs> and yeah, um, I, I've got a little dictionary story as well. Similar section it was in, in the S section. And I was compelled to go down to the university library right after my NDA and, or NDE. Uh, yeah, maybe it was an NDA too. Um, we... Uh, I got compelled to look up the word Satan and I, I just couldn't, you know, I, I was, I knew what every other definition was, but I thought, okay, I'll go down there. And of course they have the two huge, uh, volumes, uh, A through M and, and through or A through L and M through Z. 
And so I'm looking it up, and the very first reference says it comes from the Greek Satan, T-H-E-T-A-N, meaning thinker. And I'm like, wow, you know, that was just, it popped because it made so much sense that it's, we are all satanic by nature. We're, we're thinking beings, and as you've talked about, you know, it's how we use the mind and the thoughts that we entertain. And the whole thing that, you know, the law of attraction is built around and our attention and intention and then the interaction that we have as a result of that is all by choice, whether we recognize it or not. Yeah. We create it, no doubt. Right. So we're yeah. a bunch of co-creators going around Earth. What's our best effort and what might that look like? Well, I've seen this many, many times in, in workshops, but... I can give you some examples, but we get programmed from birth to death. Mm -hmm. and, and we have what we have in our lives. We are who we are based upon that programming and the actions we've take, taken based upon that. Right. Um, I watched uh, a few months ago, Tony Robbins interviewing a robot. If you haven't seen it, you can probably Google it and find it. Okay. Her name was Sophia. So it was a female robot. So he asked quite a few questions. The robot asked questions of him. They converse back and forth, just like two people. And he asked one question. And he said, do you have feelings and emotions? And she says something like, no, robots don't have feelings and emotions, but we understand what they are. He said, what do you know about quantum physics? And she said, I don't know much about quantum physics, but if I study it, I will know everything about it. Not some things, but everything. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that's a pretty bold statement. And then the last question kind of set me back and got me thinking. She said, or, or Tony says, what's the difference between a robot and a human? And she says, not much. <laughs> <laughs> and going, wow. And, and I started, again, thinking about the programming that we have. We right. just get programmed and we are who we are. We're like a robot based upon that programming. Well, so, the feelings and emotions that you mentioned that, that Tony brought up, right? We oftentimes live above our shoulders, which means we, we're not in touch with the body. We're not in touch with our senses right. to, the, to the extent of being able to rely on them. Um, one of the things that just really made sense to me was learning about the three brain system from the ancient indigenous cultures. And, you know, you start with the gut in the quantum physics realm, right? This is actually provable because now we know that there's neurocircuitry neuro in the gut and that's where all vibrations connect with the body. And so we start there, they call it the first brain, right? And then you come up to the heart and go to the head, which is yeah. where you actually make better choices <laughs> as a result when you do it in that order, right? But you've gotta be willing to feel and sense and, and be vulnerable. And as you say with the programming, we're not really taught to do that. No. And we're not, we're not taught to press delete on the, some of those programs either. Absolutely. Um, exactly. They are files that can be deleted. Yeah. Uh, uh, one guy just recently, he says, he said, I have, we we're talking about money. He said, I haven't been able to pay my bills on time or fully each month for 25 years. And I said, wow, that's a long time. I said, have you ever tried to change it? And he said, dozens of times. Nothing ever works. I said, well, what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, I've been thinking about it. I think I'm just going to cut my overhead. I said, well, that's okay. And I said, that'll probably last for about two months, three at the outside, and you'll be back not paying your bills on time. He said, well, how do you know that? And I said, well, you're addicted to it. I said, right. it's literally a, a self-reinforcing addiction, just like a drug addiction, but you're addicted to not paying your bills on time. And I said, if somebody doesn't walk you through how to break that cycle, somebody like me or somebody else, I said, you'll live out the rest of your life not paying your bills on time. And it's so true. I'm wondering why. Yeah. Okay. It's like a, a woman in one of my workshops, as she's checking in uh, the first morning, a two-day event, um, uh, I happened to be near the uh, registration table. And I saw that she had bruises on both wrists. She had a bruise on her throat. She had a black eye and a busted lip. And she's trying to cover some of it up with makeup and stuff. And, God bless um, her for showing up in that yeah. state. And you could tell she'd been right. physically abused. Yeah. So about mid-afternoon that, that first day, we're talking about relationships and things. And she said, well, I, I, I need to share. So she gets up and she said, I've been in seven abusive relationships. 
Uh, three were marriage, four we lived together. I'm living with the fellow right now. He beats me up regularly. And um, I said, well, tell me about him. She said, he's just mean and he, and he beats me. And, um, and I said, and you allow it? She said, yeah. And I said, you guys are a perfect match. And I said, perfect match. I said, you know, he, he's, he needs somebody to beat up so he can feel like he's in control of his life. And you need somebody to pay attention to you. So you're allowing him to beat up so that you get the attention. She said, wow, I never thought about that. So I started working with her. Oh, and she said too, when I left this morning, he said, if you ever try to leave me, I will kill you. And she said, I think he means it. So she said, I'm afraid to leave. I said, well, let's work on you letting go of your need for approval. That's so a we spent place. Got, I'll get into some things in the past and all that. We, we got her down to where she was so clean and clear about who she was. And then she said, well, what do I do when I go home? And I said, just go home. Walk in the door like you're feeling what you're feeling right now. Don't think, don't think anything different. Okay. So the next morning, she couldn't wait to get up front. She said, I went home last night. She said, I walk in the front door expecting him to be in his favorite chair drinking a beer. He's not there. I figured he's in the kitchen getting his own beer. So I went in there. He's not there. She said, he's probably passed out on the bed. I, she said, I go to the bedroom. He's not there. She said, suddenly, she said, it was like this overwhelming, incredible feeling came over me. And she said, I ran to the closet, opened the closet door. She said, all of his stuff was gone. And there was a note saying, I will never be back. And she said, how did that happen? <laughs> I said, well, you disconnected. Right. They no longer can beat you up because you're emotionally clear. And now, I that's a perfect example of just how powerful the choices are. And when you make them, the universe responds in ways you never anticipate. I've seen it happen hundreds of times. And it's if people can believe that we're all connected energetically, you know, it's like if you meet somebody, you, you get a feel for them right away. Absolutely. You, you know, it's, they feel negative, they feel positive, they're uplifting, they're, you know, they're needy, whatever. You get that feeling. And, and sometimes it's just like, I don't know, I just don't, I don't feel right. Something's wrong with that person, you know? Right. So, now, without the support of that, many of us, or many have um, considered that, you know, dismissive thinking. And, and you know, they, they just kind of set that stuff aside. They don't want to trust their own yeah. awareness. Exactly. So she's, uh, it wasn't probably three months after that, she contacted me, she's married in a, in a nice relationship. And I stayed in touch with her for a couple of years and uh, no abuse, no nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just a good, pleasant, happy, loving relationship. So, but I've, I've seen people break those cycles of, you know, one woman, she said, I can't be successful because of my father. And I said, well, what about your father? She said, well, he, he told me all my life, I'll never be successful. You'll never measure up to your siblings. And she said, I never knew why, but he just verbally abused me. And I said, so that's why you can't be successful. She said, yes. I said, well, where's your father now? She said, well, he died 10 years ago. I said, okay. I said, who's abusing you now? She said, I don't understand the question. I said, well, you think about it for a while. Right. Abject yeah. denial immediately when the question comes because they have, they're not willing to face it. Now, you mentioned exactly. quantum physics as well. Um, and it, I find it exciting uh, as well as phenomena full as we understand that we're actually living in quantum entanglement. And the story that you just told is a perfect example of it because there's science behind it. Yeah. Now, for millennia, we've called that living in spirit. Right. And so now science has come along and say, yep, you're right. And <laughs> here's more. Um, there's even a, a, and you may be interested in this, there's a, a Russian academician named um, Minerova. Uh, and she uh, gives a dissertation on the science now that's recent science discoveries that prove this biophysical spiritual evolution in the human genome. And it's the, to listen to it. I mean, it's kind of boring, you know, because it's a dissertation, right? <laughs> and it's it's got English subtitles, but yet there's this information now 
that it's you know cats out of the box you you've been outside the box from you know since you were little so have i it's a lot easier to read the labels that way and so you know what you're dealing with right and in becoming that cognitive scientist where we're recognizing the patterns now speaking of patterns and shifting of them how do you find some of the best methods are to identify and shift on the fly which is what most people find themselves in process of well uh, I, I i've been doing this for a good 35 years mm -hmm. 37 but really effectively for about 35 um and and I, I call it letting go basically and what it's it's what you honor the most so once i make a decision to do something i know from that point forward the actions i take are going to either move me closer to it or further away mm -hmm. that's simple you know if, right. if somebody wants to right. lose weight then every time they put something in their mouth it's going to either take them closer to that or further away from it now no. the the process of that though i'm going to ask you to go a little bit deeper and, and down into your body what's it feel like what are some of the indicators that people might recognize in themselves to help make them aware that okay this is a process and i need to pay attention well you know to me any anything that's less than loving or if you want to call it positive i don't use that word much but uh anything less than resonant loving, maybe what would resonant be a better term well it is you're resonating yeah. with something so if you catch yourself being angry well what's causing that anger you know it's it's a it's either the need for approval or the need to be in control mm -hmm. and then when you really look on a deep level the need to be in control is a need for approval so the greatest need we have as humans is a need for approval right, right. Uh, and, and we disguise it as to, to love or be loved exactly cases right yeah but it's it's all about loving ourselves mm -hmm. so um so i i just got in tune with how i feel and what i'm thinking uh you know if you're driving down the freeway and somebody cuts you off they don't know they cut you off most likely um and you're right. yelling and screaming and burning up your vital energy and they're up there whistling listening to the radio you know so uh you're the one suffering from it so uh, when you catch yourself in anything that's, you know, hopelessness, sadness, fear, anger, uh, uh, self-centered pride, you know, anything like that is is using your energy mm -hmm. and burning it up needlessly. Where if you get in uh, uh, acceptance and peace um, uh, is is the higher level where you're accepting that things are going on, but you don't have to attach yourself to it. Right. Uh, and people say, well, it's hard to let go. And I'm going, well, it's not hard to let go. If I carry this pair of glasses, if I've got these in my hand right now, that doesn't mean I have to hold them in my hand for the rest of my life. I can lay it down. Right. And same thing with anything that you're attached to like that. When it comes up, you know, if there's a fear pop up, take a look at it for what it really is. Be observant. Be observant of yourself and how you feel and your actions you're taking and make choices that'll take you in the direction you want to go. And the more you do that, I tell you, I even tell people, I don't want you to believe me. Just try it. <laughs> try yeah. it one time yeah. and you'll see it works. <laughs> That's the, the guy was just about uh, mentioning it. It's an old mixed blood Cherokee friend of mine. He's, he's passed away now. His name is Willie Whitefeather. And he used to say, you know, it's false evidence appearing real is what fear is. And that what we see we need to do is free every anxious reaction. And uh, he was a storyteller, much like us all, right? And one of the things he would say was, don't believe a word I say, test it for yourself. Test it, yep. And ultimately it proves true when you're willing to commit to the test. And, and yeah. you know, it's like truth. It, it loves being tested, right? Because yeah. <laughs> it will stand. What is letting go? If I yeah. catch myself being depressed, um, and I observed myself being depressed, I would challenge anybody to stay depressed and observe themselves being depressed or angry or fearful because it that's the first step in letting go. Once you see yourself doing it, it disconnects. Right. You can be angry and, and self-observant at the same time. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And then there's a third aspect of that that kind of comes into play of providing the next level. Um, you know, you were talking earlier about the improvement when the controller reminded me of Lester Levinson and the Sedona method, right? Yeah. And so there's this 
you know, you honor it, you don't deny it, right? You don't deny the feeling, you, you just watch it. And the more you can observe it, the less attached you are to it until you reach the state of what Lester calls what was it, imperturbability, yeah. where you can just watch it and say, hmm, and not be affected. Um, it, and I think that's where a lot of us would like to be and don't necessarily know the process that, or believe that we can, right? And the fact is, everybody can. It's just a choice. Would you agree with that? Yes, it is a choice. And, and yeah, we have, uh, there's some things that are probably harder to let go than others. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, death of a loved one, that type of thing is going to take you longer to let go normally. But, um, you know, I knew a fellow that lost uh, $2 million. He invested it into a condominium project in, in the Caribbean, one of the islands. Mm -hmm. And the people took him for his money. They never built the condominiums or anything. Well, he spent the next 20 years, every time I talked with him, that's all he could talk about for 20 years. And he died talking about that. That's, that he, he just hung on to it. It's a choice. You know, I spent a million dollars, just, just under a million, on an infomercial for television. And once it was finished, I from the top, uh, top people in the industry complimenting me on how great it was and how beautiful of the production was and all of that stuff. Well, it right. didn't work. And it cost me just under a million dollars. Well, I could still be hanging on to that or I could just go, okay, well, it didn't work. Yeah. What's next? Some What's will, some won't. So what next, right? <laughs> and I did, after about two days, I never gave it another thought. I just kept moving forward. I thought, well, I got some good footage out of it. Maybe I can use it someplace. Sure. You know? And there's always those pieces, those clips, the repurposing, uh, all yeah. those kinds of things. The, the production never goes as a wasted product in that way. Um, well, I interviewed 12 mega millionaires. They all started with nothing, mm -hmm. different industry, and they had to be worth over 200 million. One was a billionaire. So in the process of interviewing all those people, I got to know all of them. So they all became friends of mine, you know, and, and you learn from those people. You right, know? right. Uh, so there's always benefit. You know? well, but you got to just the, learn to let go. I mean, if you, you got abused in the past, yeah, it's unfortunate. It happened, but it's not happening. That's the key. It's right. not happening now. It almost seems like it's more like learning to learn. Right, yeah. because we're we're never taught how to learn in school. We're taught what to learn, and mm -hmm. I think that's a huge mistake in our educational system because it doesn't consider the holistic child, right, the body, mind, spirit. Um, exactly. And that I think there there's a movement I mentioned earlier that this, um, you know, when COVID started, I, I turned to my wife and I said, you know, I think this is going to give the opportunity because of the uh, obsession on self hygiene and sequestration, it'll give people a chance to really turn inward and start looking and cleaning up their own lives and, and self, right? And in this process, then we've been able to kind of um, the virtual world just blew wide open and groups and individuals and, and things that uh, were just in the process of starting now are in full swing because people are accessing the world through the virtual environment because they're still stuck at home or, or exactly. you know, such yeah, I've been on webinars with four or 5,000 people and right. all over the world. Now, the know. trick is to get those, you know, the, the online organizations and the organizational structures actually brought back into the real world and, and, you know, kind of move things away from the profit over people and planet agenda more towards the people and planet over profit agenda doesn't do away with profit because that's not necessarily bad. It's just how it's structured, right? right. So in the, the, um, the new normal that we're creating or, or co-creating, how do you see that from your perspective and, and dealing with the people that you do, knowing what their ideas are and, and, uh, and probably them, you know, being a little more investigative and, and intelligent than many, where do you where do you see things going? What what might we anticipate, and and what do you think might happen? Well, it's it, it's really hard to say. Uh, I mean, we've we've really progressed in the, in the virtual area. Uh, I think a lot of people are desiring to get back to where they have human contact again, mm -hmm. because it's different having contact like we're having right now and having 
sitting across the table having coffee or in an okay. event where we're, we're uh, uh, connecting with other people and hearing yeah, other Shaking people. hands and hugging. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, it, I think people really miss that. And, you know, I see a lot of fear out there right now. Well, we've been taught to be afraid of each other for the last year and a half. Now, how do we get out of that? You know, Carl Schwab or Klaus Schwab wrote his book, even. You know, well, first of all, take off the mask. That's what I would recommend. <laughs> yeah. I've, never, I've never put one on, so I don't even know what it's Me like. neither. No. Um, my, my wife and I have refused to, and I've done all the shopping. I've never had a problem. Yeah. Um, so it's hard for me to sit back and look at everybody else. And the, the, got yelled at a couple of times, but that's okay. I and, just, I, I'm just not one to conform like that, especially when I know, I mean, if I thought that it actually did some good, but I don't think it does. And the science it backs that. Put on one of those masks and then go smell the coffee and you smell it right through the mask, you know, mm -hmm. so there's no, no real value. In it. But that's, that's, that's something that's created fear. And, um, you know, and, and the vaccine and all of those things, hopefully we get through all of that and uh, we get back to some some level of normal, of, of a mixture between virtual and and live. And I mean, we're seeing here in California and where I live anyway, that the restaurants are opened up, the business opened up, people are taking off their mask and, and you still see some people walking down the street uh, by themselves with a mask on in 110 degree weather. Right, go <laughs> figure. I, I just uh, that just doesn't make sense to me. But, but I, I, you know, I think we're headed for something good. I think uh, I think people are are coming together. They're 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 realizing who the real friends are. Mm -hmm. Part of it, who they want to associate with. Even my my wife was, you know, she said, you know, this this whole thing has kind of taught me some things. She said, she said, she had all kinds of organizations she was a part of. And, and she said, you know, there's only been about three people call and ask how I was doing. And, and she said, I call a lot of people and some of them don't even return the call. So it's, she said, I've, I've learned a lot of, you know, it's not that I hate these people. It's just that, you know, I, I can tell you they're not my close friends. Um, and that's interesting is that, you know, that brings up a, a, a general state of lack of community in our country and maybe the world. It, it may be different elsewhere. I think in some places, communities are much tighter, um, especially in underdeveloped communities and world um, or countries. So how might, you know, those that, that are engaged, what do you think can be done to uh, bring a greater awareness of the need to reconnect and, and you know, figure out how we can be more agile in the near future to uh, to manage all of this and, and get through the disparities that are that have been laid before us through a fallacious narrative, in my opinion. You know, when I um, when I first started in business, uh, I didn't know anything, and mm -hmm. and I started in a direct sales company. Uh, it cost me four thousand dollars. I had nine dollars in the bank. I went to 23 <laughs> banks and loan companies before I could borrow the money. Now that's persistence. I started in business. The training I got was uh, your job is talking to people. If you talk a little, you learn a little. If you talk a lot, you learn a lot. And so I said, how much is a lot? And he said, 10 a day. I said, okay, mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to do. So once I got my $4,000 together, I quit my job at the factory and I started talking to 10 people every day. And we didn't and have you internet. You learned anymore. that listening was the better route. Definitely. But I didn't learn quickly. Okay. Uh, over the next 12 months, um, I had talked to a minimum of 3,650 people. They all told me no. Nobody bought from me. Nobody joined my business. And um, I was standing in my kitchen. This is kind of a life-changing moment. I was standing in my kitchen wondering what I was going to do. I had a notice on the door from the sheriff saying, you got to be out in five days. Your home had already been foreclosed. Mm -hmm. All my furniture had been taken. My both vehicles have been repoed. And I had a wife and a child, and I had 15 cents in my pocket. And, and I didn't know what to do. And I thought, thought about it for a little bit, and I said, you know, I could get my job back at the factory. They would hire me. But I decided, no, I'm not going to quit. So about an hour later, I get a knock at the door, thinking it's probably a bill collector or something. Right. And... It's a fellow from the company. And he said, I understand you're a hard worker, but you're not making any money. 
he said, can we talk? We, he comes into my home, sits down on the floor with me and spends two hours and taught me what I needed to be, what I needed to be doing, what I was missing, what I was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And, but the one thing he told me, he said, Jim, he said, if you'll live your life this way, it's kind of the answer to your question you just asked. He said, if you live your life this way, every time you meet somebody, not about business, just meet somebody. You're at a party, you're at a barbecue, you're in the park, you're on an airplane, you're in a coffee shop. It doesn't matter. Every time you meet somebody, he said, if you always will be thinking, what can I do to help this person? He said, you'll never lack for money. You'll never lack for friends. You'll never lack for contacts. You'll have a network all over this country. And now, of course, around the world. Right. He said, but if you're always thinking that, he said, and you got to you got to ask questions and, and people will share with you their their deepest feelings and the problems they have. And you may have a solution for it. Absolutely. If you don't ask the question. You may let somebody walk away that you had a solution to help them. He said, if you can't help them, that, that's OK, too. Or maybe, you know, somebody that can. But he says th that. I think to me, that would be the, the greatest thing if all humanity did that. Can you imagine what would happen in the world? Well, that's what Clarence or Klaus Schwab asked. Can we be caring and compassionate towards one another coming out of COVID? And, and that's exactly what we need to do is, is to you know, get through the fear and ensure it's going to feel vulnerable and maybe a bit scary at first, right? Until you yeah. realize, oh, this really is okay. And, and the reflections I'm getting back from others are far better than they would have been otherwise. Uh, I think just, you know, the basic interactions and a the, and the smile can do yeah. wonders because even behind the mask, you can tell the eyes are smiling. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Keep mask up to here. You know? Oh, you know, early on, um, we were in the store get groceries and, and we ran into another friend. Neither one of our, the three of us were not masked in a store full of masked people. And we're just joking and laughing. We all three hug each other. And you should have seen the people around just kind of step back and gawk it with these less than kind looks. Yeah. Yeah. And we're like, <laughs> I've seen it. Wait a minute. I'm not going to change who I am for you. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, no. I've seen it. Yeah, I've had a couple people stop me in stores and going, you're not wearing a mask. And one of them jokingly, I said, I don't wear underwear either. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and, and that's the thing of creating some kind of lighthearted event rather than taking it personally and being offended by it, because uh, that's easy to do. And I think that's what happens most often, because when, when we're not prepared or we're not aware or, or self-aware, have some kind of self-development within us, we tend to respond to however we perceive that we're being addressed. Yeah. Right. So we get that nastiness and we want to throw it right back. Well, no, that it's the, the choice you can make in that moment is to just be cool, recognize, okay, this other person's in a different place and, and I just want to help them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, you know, people, they, none of them want to wear them. So mm -hmm. uh, they just become accustomed to it out of fear. So. But I, I think I, I think that approach, if if people could take that approach and just help people with no strings attached, you know. And I've done it so many times where, you know, one woman I'll never forget. She 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 said, "Would you um, would you refer my book to one of your publishers?" And I said, "If I like it, I will." Mm -hmm. And so she sent me the book. I read it, and and I liked it. And so I referred her to, to a publisher and the publisher picked it up. And then she calls me back. She said, I want to pay you an agent fee, the 15% of my royalties. I said, no. I said, I didn't refer that you for 15%. I'm not an agent. I don't want to get paid. She says, well, I'm going to send you a check anyway. Every time one comes in, I said, I'll tear it up. I said, you, I do not want to get paid. She right. Said, well, that wasn't part of the agreement. And then she, she, she said, okay, will you write my forward for me? I said, yeah, it'd be my pleasure. I will write your forward. And she said, but here's, here's a requirement. You must put your website and at least a title of one of your books in that forward. I said, okay, I'll do it. So right. she was determined she was going to give me something. You know? Well, and, you know, that she felt so 
you know, it's hard for us to receive, first of all. And then when we do, we want to give back somehow, even yeah. though it, we don't have to. The, there's that desire to be reciprocal, right? And that's also missing, I think, in our society is that we don't uh, pay it forward enough. Kind of yeah. like you're saying, you know, we, we don't reach out and say, hey, can I give you a hand? You need some help. I have a philosophy too about uh, instead of give and receive, it's receive and give. And especially in the form of uh, loving yourself, because if you are not open to receiving love, then you have none to give. Well, you can't give if you don't love yourself exactly. first. And you can't give money if you don't receive. You know? <laughs> exactly. It's like receiving comes first, then, then the giving, I think. Uh, right. which, then in turn, it just keeps, it keeps working. You know, so. Well, it's like the old do be have, right? No, that's not really the word. It's be do have. Yeah. Yeah, because it's all about the, the being that we have. And again, maybe that's that point of light within us that's connected to everything that we haven't really recognized yet, let alone know how to, to use our bodies as an instrument to tune in right. Yeah. Right? Um, which gets into the quantum entanglement and, and this kind of thing that, that is coming out and many people are beginning to talk about because there is a shift taking place in our awareness and our daily experience and, and the ability that we have to, to arrive in those serendipitous moments and, and have a sense of the synchronicity that's around us in process so that we can identify, yeah, this is what's going on because the universe talks, we just don't listen. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and so these are greater levels of, of self-awareness and, and awareness of others and, and even awareness of, of Mother Earth. Now, you talk a lot about the, the changing beliefs, right? How is that process best suited for moving through those that cognitive dissonance well first of all all beliefs are false until you decide it's true then it's only true for you mm -hmm. okay um when you think about that it, yeah you know, one it person, only matters to you yeah I mean, you look at religions. Well, I asked the Dalai Lama one time, what, what religion is, the, is the, the best religion to the exclusion of all, rest, all the rest of them? And he smiled and said, uh, there should be as many religions on the planet as there are people. Which is really true because you can go into, you can go into any church and, and, and you've got a hundred people in there and they all interpret things different ways, right? You know, the Bible's been interpreted different ways. Books get interpreted different ways. I mean, everything does. So even conversations, I, I had a good friend that uh, was president of the Association for Alternative Dispute Resolution who, and Black Belt and Aikido too. He says, you know, there really is no conflict. There's just misunderstanding and miscommunication because we arrive at the table with two different dictionaries and we don't understand who, you know, <laughs> the other dictionary we think that everybody understands ours so well, no, you know conflict. we each have one all conflict is really self-conflict exactly you know, no conflict and you have a conversation you can communicate but there's conflict it's it's within you that's creating the conflict right. but then it gets back to the approval and control exactly right you, you out of control oh, I, you know uh, and the fear so when you arrive to a conversation and, and there's really no evidence that there's really something to be afraid of right and just relax because you're both there wanting to be heard and the best thing you can do is hear each other yeah okay this is the, the whole thing about empathic listening that is part of that uh, list kind of like your five right this is the the chart for listening right you start you get into that empathic listening so you kind of feel for each other you you recognize that yeah you've got some similar things and and then the generative listening comes in because you can take where you're at to someplace new together yeah and you know belief has a lot to do with communications and um you know i said that all beliefs are false until you decide they're true but that doesn't make them true you know somebody could believe that you know, money's hard to earn or relationships are difficult to keep together or it's hard to lose weight. You know, that's a belief. And does it make it true? No, 
it's, it, it's only true for you. It, exactly. It, you know, and you're going to produce whatever it is you think, exactly. think feel yeah. and believe strongest. And, and if you ever have that as a question, just look what's around you. Yeah. But a human being will go to almost any extreme to prove to themselves and the outside world that what they believe is true. They'll fight to the death, you know, making sure that what they believe is true and, get, and getting that across to you. And it may be true, maybe not. You know? it's, a, it's a mixed bag. You know, it's um, like you say, it, it may be true for you and, and you're going to create whatever, co-create, you know, because the, the, whatever you want to call the energy that's around you, it's going to give you exactly where you're at and what you're desiring at the deepest levels, even if it's unconsciously. You know, what happens with our brain, if you, if you Google making money, you'll get mm -hmm. over 3 billion files in 0.25 seconds. You Google happiness, you're going to get over 3 billion files. Right. Now, question is, do you read all of those? And the answer is no, you couldn't in a lifetime. So what do you look at? first page normally maybe the second page but mostly the first page right so let's say that your brain is like google so you 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 say okay i'm tired of just getting by financially i'm gonna i'm gonna make a million dollars this year and then your google pops up you just google that so your top 10 pop up on your first page of all the experiences you've had about making money, it's like the guy that couldn't pay his bills on time. He said right. he tried dozens of times. So his first three pages are full of all these times he's tried and failed. So he's already off course and he doesn't even know it. His Google has already said, here's, here's 30 reasons why you can't make any money. Well, it's like Einstein says, you know, you do the same thing over and over and expect different results. That's kind exactly. of the definition of insanity. Yeah. Right? Um, so how do we change that then? Well, you have to be observant and, and that, that's what it's like, you know, if you're, if you're taking a path through a field and you've taken that path and it looks like it's a shortcut, you've taken that path for years and years and years, it's all worn out. You know, every rock and boulder and tree and everything in it, and you feel safe on that path. But you look over here and you know, that is even a shorter path. But, you know, there's brush and there's weeds and trees and rocks and, you know, there might be snakes over there or something that's going to get me, you know. So right. uh, you, you go to step out of that comfort zone and you're kind of working through there and something moves in a brush and you run back. Um, and, and you, if you don't continue to take that path, you'll go back on this old path again. And it's all of that programming. And it started, it actually started if you can if you can believe that you have the dna of your parents in you and we do mm -hmm. then you must have the dna of your grandparents and your great grandparents and your great great grandparents and all the way back to the beginning of history to when we lived in a cave and our two dominant thought processes were how do i kill something to eat and how do i keep from being killed and eaten Mm -hmm. I imagine that's what it would be. <laughs> yeah, it's probably pretty <laughs> close. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. We had to eat and we had to protect ourselves. Right. So Where fear was at, was a reality. Yeah, exactly. But if if and so when you start on that path, it's not not normal for you. It's scary. And you're afraid of not literally, but you're afraid of being killed and eaten. You step up on a stage and you're, you're fear of talking to people and you're afraid of being killed and eaten. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned that that used kind of used to happen to you for a while. I know it does. To, it did for me, too. And, and we both know things to finally get through it. But the, there's still that the memory and the DNA and, and all the files that are in there, whether it's cultural memes or, or genetic um, memories and programs and, and even cultural programs that are part of that genetic code of what we learn. So we're, we're processing all of this and, and, you know, it's kind of bouncing back and forth in between the right and left hemispheres and maybe through the frontal lobe. But what we don't consider is that corpus callosum in the center that seems to be kind of aligned with the pineal gland. And, and so there's this opportunity for balance, right? And, and to be able to kind of 
be in that observer place in the center mm -hmm. of your mind watching things ping pong back and forth right yeah uh, so it, it, it's it's an interesting process to to really put the fear to the test to get through yourself walk through the door time and time again and, and begin to be a, a more aware of the, your surroundings of, of how you really do uh, feel and think and, and more importantly what your why is in life because most of us seemingly don't really connect at that level and I think maybe that's part of what this new normal can be is maybe a reassessment of what our whys are mm -hmm. yeah do you see evidence in that maybe like with your um the conversations you had with the millionaires and billionaire what was that any part of that topic or, or discussion not not so much uh what i what i found that they all had in common pretty much and and with me as well mm -hmm. is that they had they had six six steps or six keys whatever you want to call it um that that they utilize to accomplish pretty much anything you want in your life mm -hmm. um and uh, they they said it in different ways but after about the second interview i'm going wow this this is pretty close to the first one and, and a lot of like napoleon hill huh yeah a little different <laughs> language but yet the same thing yeah you know, uh, i mean first step whatever you want to do in your life you got to have a desire to change it whether it's where you are in a relationship or your your health or your your happiness, your your money, or any of those things, you've got to you've got to have a desire to change. But a desire is not enough. Right. That's what that's the trigger that gets you thinking a little bit. But it's not enough. And you know, I told and, somebody, and like you say, you got to make the decision in the next step. Right? That is the next step. Uh, somebody this morning, they said, "Well, I've got a desire to lose weight. I've always had that desire." And I said, "Well, it's not enough." I said, "Next thing you got to do is decide to be a thin person, not to go on a diet." So you got to decide to be a thin person if you ever want to become one. Mm -hmm. I said, th then your choices, you've got to watch your choices. I said, because we don't live in a, a gray world. It's black and white. Whatever you do from this point forward is going to add to your weight or take it off. And what I like <clears throat> was your be bold, right? That, yeah. That's kind of, um, well, that's how, how I feel in, in doing this podcast. I, I'm being a little bolder. I've, um, my wife suggested it several months ago. I, I used to do a show back in the early 90s that I was just enamored with and, and uh, hoped one day I'd be worthy of an interview with Bill Moyers or Jeff Mishlove, which would, were two of the guys I wanted to emulate. 28 years later, I got an interview with Jeff Mishlove. Wow. So, um, <clears throat> but after that, she had said, you know, you really need to get back into this. And, and I said, okay, I'd love to, but, I, you know, even with all the thousands of people I'm connected with on LinkedIn and Facebook, I didn't really have a close network or a door into a framework that I could access in, to, to flow, right? Because I always pay attention to flow. I'm a big proponent of, of Michaeli Csikszent Mihaly's work and, and the psychology of optimal experience, right? So in, in doing that then, and just saying, okay, I, I need this, you know, Bada boom, bada boom. And in the next month or so, everything lined up and it was like, okay, cool. You know, I must be in the right place, but I made the commitment, the choice that you're talking about. And then everything else came in to support that. <clears throat> yep. Success at anything is a question of what you honor in your life. Absolutely. A question of honor. You can honor your fear. You can honor if you go to pick up the phone and follow up on a sales call. And you get that fear and you hang up. You just honored your fear. Yeah. Well, that's what I like about the the, the the Namaste greeting. You know, I honor the divine in me honors the divine in you. It recognizes that. And when we're able to at least perhaps just believe that that's a possibility within <laughs> humanity, right? We have that in our thoughtmosphere and, and it could pop up in, in just the right moment, right? But it yeah. can't if, we're, if we don't, at least perceive or, or consider. Agree. Yeah, I, I look at everybody as a human, uh, just human being. I, I I know that more some people have more than you have. They have more money than you. They have more certain things than you may have. But uh, but that doesn't make them any less human. They're still no. they still have feelings and emotions, and they're going through hard times and things that aren't working in their lives. And you know, I understand that. Uh, I know I was having dinner one night at a at an event, a roundtable, and 
and the guy sitting next to me, I knew he was, he, he, he was worth like $12 billion. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I hit it off with the guy. We're conversing back and forth. I told a couple of jokes. He's laughing. And all The guy over here bumped, bumped me. He said, do you know who you're talking to there? I said, uh, yeah, that's, uh, oh, yeah. I forget what his guy's name was actually. Right. And, um, yeah. and he said, no, he said, this guy's worth like 10, $12 billion. I said, okay. He said, but you're telling him jokes and stuff. And I said, well, he's laughing. <laughs> said, we hit it off. You know? well, isn't it interesting how we create those levels of um, connectivity or, or separation? Yeah. Right. Because of that, that, you know, every, we all put our clothes on the same way, you know, like you said before, yeah, you we know. all have the same feelings that we're human. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We may have done different things, accomplished different things. Um, it, those that recognize that also treat you as a human being. There, there's no barriers between just because of, of things. Right or stature. Or I know. I uh, when I did the interviews for that infomercial, I did um, uh, one fellow that uh, I interviewed. He he was he was named at one point the twenty third richest man in America, and he was worth twenty three billion or something at the time. Mm -hmm. So I found out where his offices are, which were in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I called his office, and the girl answered, and and I said, "Is is Bill in?" And she said, uh, who's calling? I said, Jim Britt. She said, well, he stepped out for a minute, uh, but he'll be back in probably about five minutes. She said, well, he know who, who you are. I said, he will once he gets on the phone with me. And she said, and she kind of laughed. She said, well, what are you calling about? And I said, just tell Bill that uh, I, I'm going to increase his net worth for him. And she said, really? I said, yeah. And here's my number. Have him call me back. I'll wait by the phone right now. And sure enough, five minutes, he calls back. <laughs> and he said, I'm curious. <laughs> How are you going to increase my net worth? And I'm going, uh, so I said, I want to interview you. And we had a good conversation. Sure. And he said, well, I'm going to be in Palm Springs for about 10 days. If you want to bring your crew there, we'll set it up. And you'll, you can interview me right there in Palm Springs, and which we did. And, and he became one of my best friends. Um, you know, but... You know, he, he's just a common guy. When I met him the first time, the guy just runs to you and gives you a great big hug. You know? <laughs> and everybody else is intimidated by him. And, you know, it's, he's a person. And he's a great guy, you know. Yeah. And, and if you didn't, if you met him on the street somewhere, you probably wouldn't know. No. And, um, and that's the wonderful thing about being human and, and having the honor, respect, and maybe even reverence for others because it, it that's how you got where you're at was because of the help of others yeah exactly yeah every time i see tony robbins uh, tony worked for me for his first five years in the business and mm. and i trained him and put him out on the street and he was selling tickets for our events and um so every time i see tony or, or see something that he's doing online or something i'm going well you know i had a, I had a little bit of maybe a little bit of influence in, in his, you know, his, well, he was uh, ravenous, right? Yeah. He was just eating everything up. Yeah. And then sharing. Yeah. And that's the secret. You, you can eat it all up, but if you're not giving back. Yeah. No, he's giving back a lot. He's, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, we're still connected and, and, uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's, it, to me, it's kind of that ripple effect. Um, you know, if I can, if I can help somebody that helps somebody, that it's somebody that I, I would never even have contact with. Right. So it's, um, you know, I, I was looking at Tony's the other day. He had, what was it, uh, 6 million followers on Facebook or someplace. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah, what do you do with all that? Um, you know, the, uh, and of course, the, the ripple that you you spoke of kind of it goes back to that person who makes a choice and, and the rippling effect that that has of and i guarantee and, and i'm sure you do too when a person makes that choice and really makes the choice those ripples happen mm -hmm. and your life changes and 
it's a wild, beautiful ride when that happens too. And you watch it when your life changes, the people in your life either change or they disappear. Mm -hmm. And new new people come in because I think you know the you want to call it the mindset that we have is it, 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 it's how we view the world. Mm -hmm. And it's also how the world views us. So if you got a down and out mindset, the world is going to view you as down and out. Right. And it, so whatever it is, it, th that's the, the, if you want to call it the law of attraction, I, I, I call it the law of creation because you're creating. It's reciprocation, right? Yeah, you see things different. What you reap, you're going to sow or what you yeah. sow, you're going to reap. I mean, if, right? if, if you didn't want to be, a, if you didn't want to make a million dollars as an example, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be out looking for opportunities. But once you've decided to do that, opportunities start to show up. Right. And if you didn't want a relationship, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be out there looking for one. But once you've decided you want a good, loving relationship, all kinds of possibilities show up. If now, it's interesting also that in that process, there is the paradox of letting go of attachment to it. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, because that, that's, you know, when you're constantly, and I think this goes back to quantum physics, when you're pushing and pulling energy, it's not flowing. You're pushing and pulling energy and it, and it's not really what's working in your best at that I'll, point. I'll give you a, a funny, okay. but funny, but true, uh, experience, a, a, a fellow in one of my workshops, we we're talking about relationships and he said, well, he said, uh, I went to a workshop and, and the guy told me to make a list of all the traits that I wanted in a woman. I said, and he said, I have that list. I carry it with me all the time. I said, would you mind reading it to the group? No, I don't mind. And he starts off. She's, she's got to be five foot four. She's got black hair. She's got blue eyes. She's got this. She's, oh, man. She likes hiking. She likes this and this. Named yeah. off like 30 things. And I went, Wow that's one incredible woman. <laughs> I said, how's that working for you? He said, well, not very well. And I said, let's switch that around a little bit. I says, what would you like, how would you like to feel in a relationship? And the guy starts sharing from his heart. And I, I look around the room, there's like half the room in tears. Where mm. Before they were, the women are going like this. Right. right. So we took a break for lunch. And one of the women walked over to him and she said, can I take you to lunch? And, and she told him, she said, at first, she said, I was, I was just appalled about, by your list. She said, but when you talk from your heart, she said, I had to meet you. They're now married. Hmm. That's cool. <laughs> I, yeah. I, so, uh, I just recently got remarried. It had been 30 years and I got to the place where my desire, I finally had to let go. And I had a dream of hugging this woman and merging as one that was just phenomenal. And, and the, the series of magical, mystical things happened over the next, the course of a month and a half. And uh, it was just amazing how that sense, and she's from St. Petersburg, Russia. And I'd always, you know, wanted to feel, you know, that it's almost like a, a the juxtaposition uh, of energy uh, of who supposedly our enemy is, right? Uh, of finding a way to bridge that. And that's just been in the back of my mind for many, many years, because I don't believe a lot of what we're told about others, right? So when, when we met, sure, there was this wonderful connection, but what really imbued it with some um, depth is the, as we were, learning how to communicate with each other, we were learning the cultural differences and how the nuances uh, came into our conversations and affected them. And, and of course she loves quantum physics too. So it was, you know, it was wonderful to be able to do that. But that sense of connection, the, the depth, um, rather than thinking about it, it's that visceral experience of it that we truly desire, uh, in my opinion. And, and yeah often limit ourselves from doing it because we have the lists. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I'm sure that that's, you know, kind of uh, similar to what you've experienced as well. Um, maybe not in your first marriage, but definitely, you know, as life went on, you make those connections uh, uh, that are more powerful, more resonant, uh, as you've expressed. 
And so the, the collection of people around you now are those that resonate with you best. And, and what you do with that then is a whole new exploration of, of learning how to co-create with each other. Exactly. Yeah. So do you have any of those kind of co-creative things in, in mind for the near future as to maybe how the, the your collective may assist with the um, upwising in process? Uh, I never really thought about it. I mean, uh, you, you're talking about in family? Well, family, friends, uh, you know, how, because you guys are, are in some very influential positions, right? Well, I, you know, I am co-creating things um, and I've done for the last five years, mm -hmm. a lot of co-creation. Um, I've got a, like right now, I have a book series that's a collaboration and the purpose of it is is to uh, elevate the the public relations, the marketing, the branding, and lead generation for coaches, speakers, and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. and my business partner in it is uh, Kevin Harrington from the Shark Tank. I met Karen, Kevin, and Tony Robbins has endorsed the series. Yeah. So we got twenty co-authors in each each one of them. Uh, all the books so far, uh, six volumes have become number one international bestsellers. And uh, we're, we're just now filling up book number seven. Uh, but it's a whole process of helping people that they need to stand out. If, if they've got something good to say, um, they, they've got to stand out in social media in some way. They've got to be perceived as a, a key person of influence in their field of business. Otherwise, they get lost in all the noise. Right. And the social media is just noise. I mean, like Kevin told me one day, he said, he said, Everybody is your competition. I said, well, I don't look at people as my competition. He said, no, but I, I'm saying they're, they're trying to take up space mm -hmm. in your mind. And I said, well, how, how could everybody? He said, even the person taking a picture of their dinner and posting it on Facebook is, is, is competing for space. And I said, really? He said, what are they looking for? And right away, I got it. I said, attention. <laughs> he said, everybody's looking for attention on there. They're looking, they're going on there, see how many likes they have, trying to post stuff to get people to like it or ask questions and things. He said, so that's how we came, came up with this idea to really help people uh, to elevate their brand and, and, um, and get exposure that they would never get before. You know, what's, what's it worth to co-brand with Kevin Harrington, myself, Tony Robbins to get endorsed by Tony, you know, it's, Absolutely. it's worth a lot to your brand. You know? Absolutely. And, and, you know, as you know, that goes without saying of, of you being my guest. And, you know, my hopes are, are, go beyond that. I, I hope that with this series, I, I can show kind of like what we were talking earlier, the, the ways in which we have uh, and share empathic listening, share stories, look at the similarities, the, that golden thread of, of experience, although we may express it differently it's consistent throughout all of our experiences that lead to a better living or even a new living awareness of uh, connectivity and of the, the riches, uh, speaking of codes, right, that are available for us to experience. And it's our own direct experience that it really is the only thing that we can rely on. Mm -hmm. um, we can believe or theorize or, or have faith or all that, you know, the, whether you got faith, love, and trust, well, that all kind of spins into this unit of experience that we call <laughs> our body, right? right? And so then we are able to, to perceive at different levels. And, and I think even, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that, that I tend to kind of look at, at um, a huge number of perspectives and how they all might fit together from uh, our movement through space and going into the Aquarian age to quantum physics and how we experience quantum entanglement at a very, you know, subatomic level. And, and all of that has to have some congruence in it. And I think that's really what the apocalypse is in, in the unveiling or, or the, um, the uncovering of our natural design to a greater degree, which is one that just wants to get along and enjoy each other, right? What's yeah. so unnatural about the environment that we have now? Um, so it didn't, in all of this, and I, and I know this has been your lifelong quest and you've helped millions, if not billions at some point, right? Um, so 
in this future with the, that we're co-creating as we speak, what kinds of things do you think are most important that you could offer to others that would help crystallize that process for them into something that, that's simple and um, directly experienceable? Well, I think, I think um, you know, looking out for the, your fellow human being and being um, connecting with them on a on a on a real deep level when you I mean even if it's a smile you're giving them but uh, mm -hmm. you know be be more conscious of, of of doing that and realize that little things make a big difference for people um, you know I've had multiple times where people said I was about to commit suicide and and I talked to you or I listened to one of your audios or this or that and you know we all have an effect uh, on others and so it's just becoming aware of what kind of an effect you're having and and working hard to to really help help your fellow human being in any way you can uh i'm not talking about you know money or anything like that it's just uh it's just helping and and you know yeah, kind of being in the present moment with them and assisting in however that may require sometimes it's just a matter of listening sometimes it's a matter of giving sometimes it's a you know well, it's a matter of listening and, and taking some action that might help them. Sure. Or maybe you're giving them a little point that, that, uh, that they hadn't thought of before, you know? So it's, um, I just think if we all did that, it's just going to make a huge difference in the world. Absolutely. And uh, it's, it really looks like, you know, there's this, um, it, it may seem nebulous, it may seem idealistic, it, it may seem even utopian to believe that we can do this with the, the recognition of these, the next level patterns, if you will, and, and how we might engage them, uh, even the regenerative culture kind of perception of just recognizing how we need to learn to work with the earth and the cycles and our own rhythms and cycles and finding out what those are, right? Well, you, you, just, you know, if you look at even five years ago, there was almost, there was almost no life coaches in the U.S. and 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 almost none at all around the world. And today, I would I would estimate that there are millions of life coaches in the U.S. and and I've seen it in other countries where, like Australia or or the U.K., where like five or six years ago, it's like yeah, life coaching almost nobody does it, nobody understands what it is. Now they're everywhere. You and know, they're certificated and things like that. But I've always felt like, you, you know, you really need to have a life first before you become a coach. Exactly. And many of them don't. But uh, the intention, I think, yeah. uh, the, their intention is to help people. Absolutely. And, and some of it is for a profession. But, but uh, you know, I've talked with hundreds and hundreds of them. And um, they're, they're there to help their fellow human being. And sure. And yeah, they and and some of us, some of them is almost afraid to ask for money. They just they just want to help. Right, so right, right. I think that I just think that's a indication of of uh, things are changing and more people are wanting to help more people. I mean, you look at people's homepage on Facebook. Just go to any of them right. and see what it looks like. And it's always something about helping their fellow human being. Almost always. I mean, occasionally it's business, but. Still, it's um, it's interesting. And sometimes it's the oddball or, or the outcast or the attention yeah. getter, you know, that's just trying to, yeah, yeah, uh, not really there with uh, thoughtfulness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you always have that, but yeah. So, yeah, it's been an interesting conversation here with you. Oh, I really appreciate your time, Jim, and uh, I will have your information below in the description so that everyone can get it. I mean, the, the, um, that kind of goes without saying. Um, and I really do hope at some point that we might even cross paths in the physical realm. <laughs> and face really face. Well. Where are you located? I'm in Chandler, Arizona. Oh, well, that's We're not, not far that away. far away. I have a grandson in Chandler. Uh, well, then. I used to own a, a section of land, 640 acres in Chandler before Chandler became Chandler.
So it was cotton fields at the time, eh? And I sold it. <laughs> <laughs> I sold it for $2,000 an acre and I bought it for $1,000 an acre. Oh. I probably could have sold it for a hundred million <laughs> later. Well, today, yeah, I mean, that's, um, I came here in 81 and, and there were space in between the suburbs. Yeah. And now there isn't, it's just- Well, I was there in 73. I lived in Scottsdale for about three years and uh, there were no suburbs <laughs> to speak of. Yeah. You yeah, know, it really wasn't. So. Well, great. Again, thanks so much for joining me today. And I'm sure we'll have some great uh, things, or we have had some great things to offer the audience. And well, I appreciate stay in your touch. Time and, uh, if I'm over that direction, I'll, uh, I'll look you up. And awesome. I'm in California. So if you come this way, look me up. Will do. Thanks so much. Right. Namaste and in la catch. Thank you for watching this edition of. One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefield, and I'll see you next time.